Welcome back to another episode of Dr. J Radio Live. Of course, I am your host, Dr. J. And as always, we have a fabulous show for you today. But first, let me give some shout outs to those of who gave me some well wishing. And those of you out there who didn't want to stay, who want to stay private, of course, I'm not going to say your name. But those of you public, of course, I'm going to say it. Uh, Lou Sheehan, I see, is on. Congratulations again, Lou. I look forward to seeing you at Contact in the Desert. I see Wise Frog. Thank you for the fantastic tale as well. Adam, we have so much more to talk about his uh, encounters, which one day you will hear so much more about that. And you could see some of his amazing artwork in the two recent videos. I also see Danny from Nolins, of course. Danny, nice to see you out there. Now, of course, as you know, we've had the Contact in the Desert contest. 12 winners so far. Today, at the top of the hour, I will be announcing winner number 13. That's right, 13. And this Thursday, winner number 14. Now, let's just go over some UFO news. And for those of you out there who have been sending me the UFO news, thank you again. And for those of you who want me to mention the fact that you send them to me, by all means, just write it in the email. And, of course, I will do so. The first one being straight from the Huffington Post. Now, this doesn't surprise me. TV station refuses to comment on UFO over San Diego. Of course, who would think that the mainstream media would want to comment on a UFO? Have you ever heard this before? It's not new to me. This comes from the UK. Cigar-shaped UFO spotted uh, over a volcano. Now, I, this was reported by the express.co.uk, but of course, I don't know the location of the actual uh, volcano. But this comes to beg the question, why are they so interested in volcanoes? I would love to hear your comments on that. And of course, you could just go to drjradiolive.com, go to the contact area, and go ahead and submit them. The final piece of news I'm going to talk about is today being May 5th, the coveted day that Jaime Musan is releasing the Roswell slides. I would love to see the clear pictures of them. I saw only one, a little bit of fuzzy. It's very controversial. I would love to get your feedback. With that being said, let's bring on our guest, Mr. Nick Redford. Nick, welcome back. Well, thanks for having me back on the show again. Oh, it's always a pleasure to speak to you because you have so much amazing knowledge. Last time we were talking about close encounters of the fatal kind, and one of the first things we talked about was Roswell since some of the people affected there. And I figured the reason why I bring up that book and the fact that I brought up that question, that first question I asked you last time, is because of what happened today about the slides. What do you know about them? Did you have a chance to see them? Well, yeah, I mean, I've seen sort of, um, I guess, multi-generation versions like most people. You can see them on the Internet. But um, I actually had sort of a lot of involvement in this uh, sort of on the sidelines, but in a very couple of weird ways over the last 18 months or so, when even before the slides first surfaced, um, I'm sure for pe most people listening to the show probably are aware of the issue of the slides. And if they're not, basically what it boils down to is a couple of slides um, that were found um, in a, a collection of other slides, all dating back to the 40s and 50s, um, that originated with one particular couple, uh, both now deceased. And um, essentially... The, the slides all look like regular kind of vacation shots and holiday photos and places like that, things like that. Um, but reportedly amongst this collection um, were two slides, which are some which largely sort of hidden away, if you like. And they seem to show some sort of strange body in a glass canister, a uh, very short dwarfish body with a oversized head and skinny arms, et cetera, et cetera, looking somewhat like a, a typical alien. Now, the, the slides were reportedly uh, found back in the late 1990s in Arizona at a, like a, a house sale. And um, there were really nothing was done with them for, for years. You know, 1998 is pushing 20 years ago now. And um, 
But what happened was that they eventually reached um, a group of people who become known as the Dream Team, various people um, involved in the UFO subject, uh, including Don Schmidt and Tom Carey, who've written, written quite extensively on Roswell. Um, now, what happened was that from someone I still don't know, um, I was given the name of the um, elderly couple that reportedly the slides originated of, well, and the names were Bernard and Hilda Ray. And what's interesting is Bernard Ray was a geologist who actually worked out in the Roswell uh, region in, the, in 1947, so he was in the right place at the right time. And the rumours that uh, Hilda Ray was connected with Eisenhower and his wife, and whether or not that's going to come out in the Mexico thing, I don't know. But um, I guess we'll all find out by tomorrow morning. But I was given the name of Hilda Ray and uh, Bernard Ray and their connections to Roswell, and also information on aspects of the body and, and what it looked like. And I t told the Dream Team, I said, hey, you know, I know there are these rumors going around, but nobody had mentioned the names publicly. And I said, but I've been given quite explicit details. It was in a very sort of weird phone call that I got. And they said, well, what was the information? I said, well, this is the names I was given, Bernard and Hilda Ray, et cetera, et cetera. And there was kind of almost like a stunned silence when they realized that someone else was in, was in the know. Someone else knew everything that the Dream Team knew as well. Now, I'm still not sure, you know, what was behind this, but it got even more sinister when about a year ago or thereabouts, me, Rich Reynolds, uh, who runs the UFO Conjectures blog and who was also, deep, or, and still is deeply interested in the slides, and Tony Bregalia, another man who's um, heavily involved in the, the slides issue from the beginning, all three of us had our computers hacked by someone who was clearly looking for information on the slides and actually taunted us with by when we were sending emails to each other about the slides, was clearly reading all our emails and essentially tried to taunt us by responding to them in his own emails. And he went by the name of A Glass Darkly and used a safe mail account, which eventually uh, was successfully shut down. And there was lots of rumors as to who the hacker was and um, theories ranged from just somebody in ufology right to the other end of the spectrum of somebody in some intelligence agency of whatever nation, who knows, who was trying to find out more information. So the, this is just a, a small amount of the weirdness that's gone on behind the scenes, never mind the public investigations. This was sort of really weird stuff that impacted on people like me and Rich Reynolds. And it was very, it's been sort of a very strange, odd situation for the last 18 months. The, the fact that you were hacked, of course, gives you the inclination that you were onto something. Obviously, if it was just a, a typical hoax, you know, you don't expect your account to be hacked, let alone three separate people's account, even though they're linked together. I got a question about the slides. I'm a son being the journalist that he is uh, hosting 24 hours, uh, five nights a week, and then Tercer Millennio Sundays. He's always big on news. Every time I present him with UFO footage, if he doesn't post it right away or talk about it right away, it's old news to him. And I was a little blown away when I first heard that he wanted to sit on these till today from a couple months back when I, we talked about this in, in the, the UFO Congress. And I wanted to know if you know the, the reasoning. I mean, obviously, we can't speak for him. But yeah. since you were be involved behind the scenes, do you know why he wanted to sit on these for three months? No, I honestly don't. And if I did, I, I would honestly tell you. Um, you know, I, I've never been part of the dream team. And I, and I, I wasn't a part at all of this, you know, the thing that's going on in Mexico. Well, I, had it been me, yes, I would have done what they've done, which is to have, um, you know, people with credentials who can look at the body and determine if it's, you know, a real body or is it, is it a human with some bizarre deformities? Is it a mummy? Is it something that's humanoid but not human? I would have somebody look at it like that, but I would just put it in the public domain. I wouldn't when, if I felt that I'd got, you know, a couple of interesting statements from qualified experts, I would just put it all out into the public domain for people to see immediately. I wouldn't hang on to it for months. I just don't see the point in doing that, you know. Um, for me, the, the fact that the story is surfacing at one place in Mexico kind of limits who's going to be able to see it because you've got to pay 
to view it. You know, if it was me, I'd just do it. I'd video it, you know, and um, put a video on YouTube. Anyone can see it for free. Um, so I would have just put it straight out there. But in terms of, you know, the background, I don't know as to, you know, what, what deals were done or anything like that. So. I, I agree with you that I would release them too right away because you never know. Although you may have some of the best experts looking at it before you release it, once you release it to the public domain, you may have experts yeah. out there who weren't even interested that step forward to analyze it. So I, I, I'm always for the fact, give it to the public and help them be a jury to decide something rather than keeping it private. Yeah, and I mean, you, you bring up a good point because, you know, I mean, I can investigate Roswell from the perspective of, like the story I just told you about the hacker and how I was given, you know, the names of Bernard and Hilda Ray before, way before they were even in the public domain. I can talk all about that and investigate that, but I'm not an expert on, you know, slides and old 1940s era emulsion on slides, you know, and that kind of thing, nor am I an expert on some of the more rare human deformities and deformities and genetic conditions that might have uh, play a role or you know that or evidence that we're dealing with something totally non-human um so i think putting it all out there would have been the better approach and i think it may well have opened more doors i mean the one thing about the whole roswell slides issue is that a great deal has been done behind closed doors. Now, I don't fault them for doing that, but I do think there's a good argument to be made. Put it all out and and just see who comes forward. Um, it may be people you never anticipated uh, who can sort of fill in the dots and, you know, join the points together. But um, I'm guessing by tomorrow we'll have a, a much bigger picture when people who are, who have who are sort of logging on and watching it tonight, or even who are in Mexico. I'm sure a lot of people are going to be blogging from it. Um, now, whether or not we'll have more answers or more questions by tomorrow, I don't know. Um, the thing I've pointed out in a couple of blog posts I've done is that whatever the answer, I don't think the world's going to be any different tomorrow. The main reason being that, as interesting as I think the slides are, they're still slides. You know, you cannot prove an alien exists by from a slide, you need DNA or you need a body. All the slide tells you is that it possibly dates from 47 and it shows a small body. That, that's really, I'm not being defeatist or negative, but really that's all it shows. It's a small body photographed 70 years ago. And on that issue alone, that's not enough to convince the world's media and the skeptics and everybody else that it's an alien from the Roswell crash. You know, we act. We really don't have anything firm that ties it to Roswell, other than the fact that Bernard Ray was in the Roswell area in 47, which is very intriguing. But, you know, it's, it's also still a leap from saying that means this body was found in Roswell in 47. So I think, I think really the controversy won't end tomorrow. Arguably, it'll just begin at an even greater level, I think. I think so, too. I, and every time something like this happens of this magnitude, it creates a big ruckus. And then, of course, there's the divide. Like you said, the skeptics, the people yeah. that don't want to believe anything, no matter what, they're they're not no matter what, they're going to find a hole to, to, to drill in yeah. this fact. And, and another fact that you mentioned is you're right. Even though we can confirm, OK, this is a real slide. What's in the slide is obviously uh, real, but then again, how could we prove the fact that it was a body versus a, a, a plastic toy? We need the DNA. But the Roswell fact that you mentioned, how do we know it's from Roswell aside from that gentleman that you mentioned? Or was it from 48, the Aztec crash? Or what if it's five years later from the Cayman, Arizona? Yeah, well, that's the whole point. We, we actually don't. Um, we, we Literally, the only thing that links all this to Roswell is the, the link with Bernard Ray. Now, the, the Rays um, lived in Midland, Texas, and but Roswell was one of the areas that Bernard Ray's job as a geologist covered. Um, so that is interesting, and people have said, well, could he have actually seen the bodies at the crash site? Well, that's not impossible, um, but I would have thought if he'd seen them at the crash site and there was chaos and everything else, and he was perhaps brought in and warned not to talk about it, why on earth was he then allowed to take a picture of the bodies? 
you know. And what's interesting, I don't know if you know this, but in the slides, one of them has like a, a man in the background and one of them has a woman in the background in the reflection. So they've clearly taken turns to photograph the body. That sounds like that the pictures were taken in quite a relaxed situation. You know, it's like if me and you had found our way into a military installation where alien bodies uh, were stored, I don't think the two of us would take the time to make sure we both posed nicely next to the body. You'd just get a couple of pictures and get the hell out of there. That's right. That, you know, that sounds like the exact opposite with these pictures, though, that they're nicely framed. And um... so, you know, but with, again, we don't know, you know, what the circumstances were in relation to how the photographs were taken. For example, people have said that if the the story about Hilda Ray having very close connections to the Eisenhowers, and there is some um, evidence to support this, then what if that had a bearing on how the Rays got to see the images that, you know, they were literally shown them by somebody connected to Eisenhower, and that from there, you know, they took pictures. and uh, But then again, it's, it, it kind of, for me at least, stretches credibility to think that the most secret discovery of all time, arguably, um, that even someone like the president would say, well, would you like to come along and take a picture of him? You know, it's kind of like President Obama today saying to one of his best friends from college, hey, you know, do you want to come and photograph the Roswell bodies? I just kind of find that such a, a big lapse in security, you know, and somebody like Eisenhower wasn't a fool. The idea of letting somebody take pictures and getting into the public domain... I'm not saying it's impossible, but I am saying it stretches credibility to an extremely you know, lengthy degree. It does. And going back to what you said about the fact that they are posing, it looks more like you go to a museum versus sneaking into a military installation. And who would allow those photographs aside from within the military? And then think about the fact 1947, a female's role in the armed forces was limited to either secretary or nurse. What would she be doing, you know, in such a clandestine organization with a, a, you know, not to be sexist at all, but this is the era of 1947. Well, yeah, I mean, we don't know who the, the woman is because we can just sort of see from the waist down, you know, a dress, et cetera. Um, it could have been a nurse in, you know, a civilian outfit or it could have been Hilda Ray. We just don't know. But again, I think one of the things that people, people are focusing on more on what, picture shows when I think there's an equal argument for saying they should be focusing on why are the pictures taken with people standing behind them in what seems like a relaxed environment how did they get in there how were they allowed to leave with the pictures and I guess one of the most important things that I've never really seen commented on and I've just been waiting to um, it's the fact that the slides are, are in slide cases you know in slide frames in other words they're mounted now, that suggests to me that if you're going to mount these pictures in slides, they may well have been shown to people 50 or 60 years ago. Um, and, of course, if they're in slides, that suggests somebody took them to, like, the equivalent of Walgreens back then or whatever and actually got them exposed and mounted. So, again, that begs the question, well, who would actually do that? You know, you've got these top-secret pictures of dead aliens and you're going to take them to your local Walgreens to get the pictures exposed and say, oh, by the way, you know, can, him, can you get them loaded into slide frames? And, you know, the, the person who's, who's uh, developing it and, and mounting them is surely going to have questions about what they show. That's so right. why hasn't anybody else come forward to say, hey, you know, my grandfather was the guy at the local pharmacy that developed the slides, and he always talks about these weird slides that somebody brought in one day that that hasn't happened and i thought that something like that might have happened you know you know if 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 it was brought to any photographic facility to or or developing facility as you mentioned i, I would think the clerk would just go berserk looking at it yeah. and would probably steal a copy for himself and that would have leaked then uh, you know well, you would you would think that this would have been processed if it was within the military in their own little black room it's funny you should say that because uh, last year I wrote a book called The Zombie Book and um, you're a bit like an A to Z on zombies. And I promoted the book at a conference earlier this year in Dallas. It was called the Walker Stalker Convention. They had like people from The Walking Dead along. And I took a bunch of pictures 
of um, some of the, you know, uh, the people who were dressed up as zombies at the convention. And I took them to my local Walgreens to be developed. And the guy who developed them said, oh, this is great. You know, it's is the best pictures I've had to develop in a long time. And we had a chat for like 10 minutes, and I was telling him more about the book and, you know, the people who were dressed up as zombies. So in other words, you know, the people who develop the pictures do remember the more way of weirder or unusual pictures they develop and as with the case with me we had a fun chat all about zombies for 10 minutes as a result you know <laughs> now going back to the actual slide itself of the actual being uh, this is a question that's been stuck in my mind for quite some time because see what i've seen you've seen the actual slide i've seen one fuzzy version of it so it's yeah. not even all that clear and the what i saw in there looks obviously like you know short gray with a giant head but you see so many different variations and over the years so many photographs of grays have been released or purported grays do you think this fits similar to what other legitimate pictures of grays were or do you think all the other ones out there are not legitimate well that, that's the big problem you know i mean you can make an impression from a of something from a photograph but the big question is is it real? Now, the, th the important thing about what that body is, even the skeptics, very few people, if any, doubt that the photograph is, is real. M most, even the skeptics, most of the skeptics don't think it's, a, it's a, like a special effects model. They think it's either some sort of extremely bizarre genetic anomaly in a human, or it's like a, like a mummy, the mummified remains of a, of a mummified child, you know, that kind of thing. And if you Google, like, mummified child um, and go to Google Images, you will find a lot of pictures that look somewhat similar in the sense that they're small bodies laid out on blankets, like the, and, the, um, and the, uh, the Roswell body, if that's what it is, that's laid out on a blanket, and they're in glass cases. So there are a lot of parallels with the mummies. The, the problem with the mummy theory is that if you look at the pictures of the mummies, they tend to look very withered and lined and dark. Now, the, the Roswell slide, again, if that's what it is, the skin looks bright colored. You know, it's like it's not dark like a black or a brown. Um, it looks bright and, and it looks very smooth. It doesn't look withered and lined and wrinkled like... Um, you know, the, the mummies do. Uh, that, that's one of the things of mummification. You know, the body looks sort of uh, withered and drawn and, you know, sunken in itself. These, that, that body doesn't. So that's something, you know, that I think is important. And um, But as to whether it, you know, shows a grey, I mean, the big... The, the thing we can say most of all is that it has a large hairless head, a spindly body and thin arms, um, and in that sense is... Do, does fit the pattern of what people said about the Roswell bodies, that they were small with large heads. Um, so, but whether or not that means they're dead aliens from Roswell, you know, that, that's, that's the issue where we either take the leap to that conclusion or we sort of stand back and wait for more info to come in, you know. The million dollar question going 70 years. I, going to what you said about the mummified remains, just like you said, Google mummified children, or, or especially if you look in South America, not only do you find something similar, you find them with large heads because there's a history of these giant heads in South America. I've seen several images from Peru and little museums here and there. I know Ellie Marzulli and Rick Schaaf taken several trips down there and gone to little desolate museums that most mainstream people don't know. Have you seen any of those pictures that I'm talking about, the South yeah. American mummies? Yeah, I've seen like the elongated heads, and you know, and, and you're right that, that the um, you know the some of the photographs of the mummies, the the way they're laid out. Now that doesn't necessarily have, to have a bearing on the body or not, but the way they're laid out in a glass case, and they're small, and they're on the backs, and they're laying on, and the, the body is laid on a blanket. That's how many of the mummies are presented. And that's exactly how the body in the Roswell slide is presented. It's in a glass case, it's on its back, and it's on a blanket. Um, what that means, if it means anything, you know, I, I just don't know. The, the one thing that is interesting is that there's like a handwritten placard um, in front of the body on the, on the, um, 
on the on the glass case itself. And um, if that can be deciphered fully, well, that might give a few answers as to what it shows. Um, a lot of this is down to uh, things like there are certain computer programs that can, you know, sort of clean up and make clearer blurry writing on old photographs and things like that and also interpret what it sees and and fill in the gaps and of course you have to be careful with this sort of technology that it doesn't sort of you know lead you in the wrong direction but i mean if a skillful photo analysis company could really get to the heart of what that placard says we know it's handwritten um that would obviously push it down one path or push it down another and you know, I suspect that issue of the writing on the on the sign will be one of the key issues brought up in the Mexico thing. I'm glad you brought up the writing because that reminds me of that very famous photo of the Roswell Daily Record where General Ramey empties the saucer story, and there's Colonel or Jesse Marcel Sr. sitting with the weather balloon footage. And Colonel Blanchard with a note in his hand. Well, because of the computer software, only in the last 10, 15 years have we been able to decipher some of what it says. And just like you said, it, it's the picture of, of the, ac- the actual picture that they used to debunk themselves is what's undoing themselves. And I'm hoping that the same premise applies for this, that once we can actually clean up the image and get to the bottom of what the writing says, we'll get much more answers. Well, and it's interesting, you know, when you talk about that particular footage, uh, the, excuse me, the note in that old photograph, uh, where, you know, the, the whole Marcel and Raimi thing, um, deciphering that with the computer software does seem to show, you know, it's hard to pick out all the words, but you can pick out words like Fort Worth and disc, and it actually does look like in one place you can, and it's hard to, figure out what else it could be it does look like it says victims of the wreck you know and or at the, and at the very least it looks just like the word victims now of course if that memo was not meant for public consumption and it wasn't wasn't meant to be photographed or even if it you know at the time they didn't care about it being photographed because nobody would ever know that 60 years later you would have all this advanced computer software but i think the fact is that um if it is, if it does reference the word victims, and it does look like that, then clearly we're not talking about weather balloons because weather balloons didn't have crews. Even the story that the, or the theory, I should say, that the Air Force came up in 1994 with a mogul balloon, which was like a, a huge balloon array to spy on the Soviets, you know, in, in terms of their um, atomic bomb developments. Even mogul balloons didn't have crews. So the word victims should not appear in that document at all. Uh, You're absolutely right. And one thing that Don Schmidt always reminds me of, and I think it makes so much sense, of all the different explanations for Roswell, the first one being the crash saucer, the second being the weather balloon, the third being the the mogul, and the fourth being the crash test dummies, there's only one of them that has witnesses, and that is the first one. Have you ever heard of a witness that said, I was part of Project Mogul recovering in July 1947 in Roswell? I haven't. No, nobody's ever said that, and nobody's ever said, you know, we, we know people who were involved in recoveries of crash test dummies. The problem is we don't have anybody who has confirmed they were involved in a crash test dummy on the Foster Ranch in the summer of 1947. That's where the story, you know, the angle is let down. Now, where I kind of differ with uh, some people in ufology is I'm not entirely sure that, you know, a lot of people point the finger at the Air Force and say they're the bad guys covering it up. I actually wonder if today's Air Force may actually still, maybe as much in the dark as we are. Now, that might sound strange, but I actually think what could have happened is that probably at least probably no later than the 60s, that all of the wreckage, the bodies and everything else may have been sort of consolidated into one place and put under the jurisdiction, not of like the Air Force or the Army or whoever, but some sort of black budget agency that, you know, is answerable to no one, that doesn't, isn't covered by congressional oversight. And for all intents and purposes, doesn't, doesn't exist and you don't get access to it unless you are really in the know and have a need to know. And that might not include, as bizarre as it sounds, the concept, that might not include today's Air Force, 
or in the Pentagon. It might be, you know, a really elite, almost like a rogue organization that even the government itself, the elected government, isn't aware it exists. It's almost like a secret government within the within the open government. Uh, um, and I do sometimes wonder if, you know, there could well be people in the Pentagon tonight sitting around watching the footage in Mexico because they're in, as, in the dark as much as we are. You know, they might be sat around a table right now, you know, 20 or 30 of them, wondering yeah. what's going to appear. You know, but the, the concept of that sounds strange to people, but that could be how the secret has been kept. It does not sound strange to me at all. And I've always asked, the, wondered this theory of myself is similar exactly what you said, but rather than it being a, a government agency that answers to no one, a private corporation. Why? They're not they're not suspect to the Freedom of Information Act. Yeah. They can essentially do whatever they want. So if if and going back to Eisenhower, I always go back to 1961 when he's leaving office right before Kennedy takes place, and he warns us: beware of the military industrial complex. What I got out of that is if you believe the fact that he met with the ETs in Edwards at the time, Muroc Airfield, and started the program or was uh, briefed by Truman, it sounds to me like he was cut out of it. So this makes perfect sense if you're saying in the 60s that everything was sort of consolidated out of the hands and therefore the Air Force doesn't know and maybe the director of the CIA doesn't know. Uh, that remains to be seen. Uh, we do have uh, – obviously here's a, a – something. Let me find it again. Wise Frogs, this is about 10 minutes ago. Going back to when we were speaking about the photo processes, there was a comment, and I was hoping you could comment. It says, they would just think that, this is again, with the photo processing, that once we clean it up, they would just think it was some weird Halloween pick and think nothing else of it when processed like that. I think that's what the skeptics will do. Do you think that would be the same, the case? Well, yeah, I mean, somebody might just say, you know, um, you're on about somebody processing it in like a, like an old version of Walgreens, that kind of thing. Is that what you mean? Yeah. It, yeah. Well, yeah. Well, I mean, you can make that argument, and I'm sure, you know, before digital cameras came along, people saw all sorts of photographs sent in, you know, for processing, and they probably had a laugh and a joke behind the scenes about the photographs, you know, and they, they might have brought it up with the customers and they might not. I mean, the fact is, ironically, you know, I gave a perfect example of how the guy in Walgreens by me you know, brought up the zombie pictures I took, and he said it made a nice change from just pictures of, like, mountains and, you know, beach shots, that kind of thing. And we got onto the subject of my book and what I did for a living. Um, so I don't hold to the idea that the staff wouldn't have talked about it because I'm one person that they have spoken to, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm nothing unique about me. I'm sure things like that have happened loads of times. So... Um, but the point is, it doesn't matter if the person was told it was just a genetic anomaly or if they were told it was just a Halloween thing. They may have remembered it, and they may have mentioned it to the family when they got home. You said, hey, you know, I developed these photos today, and they look really weird of this strange little body. But the guy just said they were like Halloween props, but I'm not so sure. Somebody might well have remembered that conversation because it's so specific, you know. I agree. I, we, I have another question here uh, from Twitter from another listener, Eugene M. Rosa. Uh, he missed the opening, and, and this is directly to you. Has Redfern addressed Dolan, Linda Moulton, Howe, and everyone else involved with the Roswell slides ruin their career? Well, um, I think on the issue of people ruining their careers, I think it depends on what you say. I mean, I'm very careful to talk about what I know, what I think and what I've experienced, like the computer hacking thing, like somebody giving me the name of Bernard and Hilda Ray before it was even public domain and it was only known to the dream team. Um, so I've talked about all that, but what I won't do, unless there was actual proof, you know, you, you won't see me standing up and saying, I'm convinced that, you know, these are the bodies from the Roswell crash and they are extraterrestrial, because I think, I mean, who's to say then they may well be, but on the other hand, you can't make, or at least I can't make, a forthright statement to that effect without having proof or 99.9% .9 proof to say that that is what they are because you do stand a major chance of taking a huge fall. It's the same way that there were certain people who championed the alien autopsy film before all the evidence was in and you know, the, the story finally collapsed. 
But it was a very similar thing. Well, we've got this footage, it looks real. You know, there are these guys working on this strange-looking body. Um, you know, there were rumours back then that Truman was in one of the shots in the footage. You know, we've got Eisenhower linked with these. So, you know, I'm not saying it falls in the same category, but I'm always very cautious about explaining what I think is I'm sure of, what I know, what I suspect, and what I think is possible and what I speculate on. And if you don't do that, if you don't qualify it, then, and you take a fall, you have no one else but yourself to blame, you know. I'm glad you actually um, mentioned that, the alien autopsy, because when that happened, of course, we had the same thing, the delayed release, and then you had to pay top dollar to be part of the screening. And then for months, there was the speculation of, could it be real? And like you said, they were talking about Truman being it. And then not only did it collapse, but anybody who put their stamp of approval on it really was hurt uh, for years to come. And, and Ray Santilli, I mean, he must have made a whole lot of money. And I don't know, was he, whoever thought of that hoax, was it maybe somebody in the clandestine organization that's keeping a secret to muddy the waters? Or was it just for a profit venture? But the same unraveling seems to be now in that 20 plus years later, we have another delayed release. We have purported slides of the same event, Roswell, instead of the actual video, showing the actual beings. And the difference of the two bodies from 20-some years ago and now is drastically uh, you know, different. Oh, yeah. I mean, the, you know, the alien autopsy body versus the slides bodies. You know, the slides <laughs> show something that looks barely bigger than you know, a little baby. And it's scrawny and skinny and you know, just looks barely as if it could wander around, you know. Uh, whereas the alien autopsy film was the creature that was like five feet tall, you know, big muscular legs and a huge bloated stomach, um, completely different. Now, even though I don't think the alien autopsy film, you know, is what it was purported to be, there are actually some weird aspects to that uh, film. I'll tell you why. For example, um, the... You know, the story is that Ray Santilli faked the footage. Um, or his view is that, you know, he restored the footage um, and, you know, some of it was remade um, because the original film was degraded. But that's sort of like a grey area, you know. But there are certain issues that still have not been um, explained. For example, you know, people put to Ray, well, if you fake this, where did you get the 1947 era US clock which appears in the film? No answer has been given to that. Um, now, if Ray or any of his colleagues had said, well, here's a receipt, and this shows how we bought it from this company that deals with old stock furniture and items for old movies, you know, or when you want to make an old, a movie that's set in the past, that would lay to rest. It would also lay to rest, um, you know, if they could explain where and from whom they got the uh, medical equipment, which is legitimate le me medical equipment used in the film. It's not just like a metal tin and a knife. It's real medical equipment. If they could explain where they got that from, that would put that matter to rest, and we would all be convinced. The problem is there are things like this. Um, Ray also said that he couldn't remember um, the location where it was shot, the actual apartments, which sounds very weird, you know. And my view is that we haven't had the full story. Um, I, I wonder if the footage fell into Ray's hands and, um, you know, he now obviously has it and owns it, but, you know, did it have origins that go back before Ray? You know, these are questions that people in the Roswell, excuse me, in the alien autopsy uh, community who still believe the film, these are the sort of issues they've raised. You know, I'm sort of parroting their concerns and, and issues about like the clock and the, the scalpel and all that. Where do they get it from? And just tell us and prove to us you bought it from those places. You know, uh, One thing that I always gets that I've always wondered going back to when this was about to be released and then of course finding out it was hoaxed and it was on Fox, Fox 11. I remember they had the hour program, Alien Autopsy. I always thought the possibility is what if he actually, just like you said, did really obtain the footage and then sometime from the point he obtained it and announced the release of the screening that he was gotten to by some agents or some clandestine organization that basically threatened him, took it from him and said, well, since you're already going to have a screening, 
screen this and gave him what to screen. But that never, for me, qualified the issue of Kodak analyzing the film and saying it's either 1947, 1967, or 1927, which it can't be 1927. What do you think about that fact, the, 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 the well, date I mean, stamp? Well, I mean, there are multiple theories, you know, the date and thing, and, you know, these are always controversial issues. Um, what I found interesting about the Alien Autopsy film, which I still found interesting, is that, I mean, if it's a fake, you know, and, it's, and it was done by Ray and his friends, then it's a really, really good fake. You know, you had people like major Hollywood experts, um, special effects experts saying that, you know, if the guys who made this, they would hire them immediately, you know. If you look at, like, the feet and the muscles in the legs when they move them, things flex, you know. It, it actually is a really well-put-together model, if it's a model. Now, what I find intriguing is that if this is supposedly you know, presented to the world as coming from Roswell or wherever, and, you know, you want to convince the UFO community and everybody else, why not make it look like the typical grey? You know, the the face looks very human. Yeah, it's got black eyes, but they take out, like, the black uh, lenses and they're normal eyes underneath. It has, like, really... If you look at the thighs, I mean, they look like an athlete's thighs, you know. Um, The stomach is huge. You know, it's bulging. Um, And it's, like, five feet tall. So I I kind of find that interesting, that the the footage goes against totally against the grain of what, for years, we've been told the aliens look like. And I thought, I think an astute hoaxer might have made them look more the way that people would have expected them to appear. Now, I'm going to go back to something we talked about earlier, and this actually links up to... uh, Now, you talked about your zombie book, but was that before or after Close Encounters of the Fatal Kind? Sorry, you broke up a bit then. Say that again. Was your zombie book, was that before or after Close Encounters of the Fatal Kind? Oh, that was after. That just came out um, about seven months ago. Ah, okay. Well, going back to Close Encounters of the Fatal Kind, I'm going to link up the the slides with your book and the research and, of course, with Roswell. It's been purported you've done research on this, and Robert Wood, Dr. Wood, talked about the alien pathogens, about people dying when they've come in contact. Do you think the fact that this being is encaged in glass is, again, this is pure speculation, is it there to, is it the reason it's glass not just to preserve it, but to protect the people around it? Or is the pathogen so strong and the, the glass at the time so weak that they seep through and probably have killed everybody involved in the photographing? Well, I mean, that's an interesting point because I think one of the, one of the most significant things that a lot of people forget is that if you're dealing with a, you know, a creature from, another world or even just a you know a human that may have died under curious circumstances you take care when handling the body you know if you go into a zone where for example there's plague and you find a dead person well nobody with half a brain is going to go meddling around and pick the body up with a you know the bare hands or whatever you know particularly if the person's covered in sores and oozing blood and whatever else you know um and even though this was 1947, before the space race, you know, and things like this were all in its infancy, um, I, was, I mean, the, the, the British, U.S. government, excuse me, had a committee on biological warfare existing way back then. Uh, a lot of the files have been released, and a lot of them talk about how there were concerns of hostile nations infecting the U.S. cattle herd with uh, pathogens and viruses and things like this. So, in other words, it wasn't all new to them at all in '47. It was still well advanced back then. And um, that's one of the other reasons why I have certain issues with this angle of people just being allowed in to photograph the body freely. The idea that, you know, it's bad enough dealing with a virus or you know, um, a circulatory system, a blood system that's terrestrial, you know, that's human, Uh, never mind um, an entire bodily makeup from another world. And and I think that's an important issue, that surely the medical conditions and guidelines would have been so stringent, anybody and everybody out of the way and, you know, just 
to keep for their own safety, never mind anybody else's, you know. So. Now, Roswell was extremely famous because it was the first of its kind in the sense that the public got to it first, or at least they released that statement first. But we know that there was other crash materials first. There's the Cape Girardeau, 1941, supposedly Battle of Los Angeles, netted two uh, UFOs, and then going back to Aurora, 1896. Because of what you just said, do you believe that when the event happened in Roswell, they had already had dealt with the people dying from pathogens from prior crashing retrievals? Um, well, I mean, you know, we, we do have these earlier crashes. I actually don't live that. I live in Dallas, and that, which is only about a 45-minute drive from the, you know, the site of the so-called Aurora crash in the 19th century. Um, I mean, these earlier crash stories are interesting. Um, the only thing I would say is, you know, they, they don't have the number of witnesses. It doesn't necessarily mean they're not credible, me, but we don't have the number of witnesses that we do have for Roswell. So, you know, I think it's difficult to say which was the first or which came before this one. You know, what, were there earlier ones? I don't know. But I think just purely the common sense factor of stumbling across unusual bodies regardless of what year it was, 41, 45, 47, 52, whenever, if you stumble across something like this, number one, you're going to take steps to preserve it. If it's out in the hot sun of Roswell, you know, in July of all months, I mean, it, the weather would have been roasting That's back right. then. Um, so on top of that, as well as trying to preserve the bodies, you know, I mean, you you don't need to be a scientist to know if you're scooping up a dead, mushy, decaying body and you've got a cut on your hand, and this is something that looks not human, and you get it into your bloodstream or in, into a cut on your hand, not even an idiot would need to be told that you need to get to the base hospital quickly. You know? <laughs> That's right. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it's one of these things where you don't need laws and guidelines to handle an extraterrestrial bodies to be put into place. It's, it's just common sense. Um, you'd like to get bitten in by a dog in the street today. Well, if that dog's foaming at the mouth... You don't take a chance that you might get rabies. You go to the hospital immediately. Let alone it being something bizarre that I've never seen in my life and doesn't exist. An encyclopedia comes near me with a bizarre odor and bites me. I would be running to the hospital faster than I would exactly. if I had rabies. Now, I think you know a lot of the a lot of the issues are common sense based as to what should have been done and what shouldn't have been done, and. You know, we, we might find ultimately the, the slides are exactly what they uh, purport to be. I'm not saying it's impossible because all this weird stuff of me being given the names, then all this strange computer hacking, which was actually done through Safe Mail, which is Safe Mail is basically a, a, an Israeli based company um, that allows people to essentially hide their identity. Safe Mail is a really good way to protect the identity of the user. So, you know, we had this Israeli, Israeli company, somebody hiding behind a fake email or, a, you know, an alias email account, um, hacking uh, in search of the photographs and things like this. Um, so it may well be that they could be the real thing. However, it's just, it's just the sort of the logical and common sense factors that for me, still put up a red flag. Like I said, the fact that they were able to photograph the, the pictures, they were allowed to print them, they had them at home, they mounted them on slides even, you know, which suggests they were put on screens, like I said, and shown, maybe even to show to friends and family. And if that's the case, well, where are those friends and family or their descendants? Um, you know, the, the posing issues of the man and the woman, I, I just don't get how all that could go on when you're dealing with not just not just a major secret, but if they were taken in 47, I would imagine there would have been massive concern and worry behind the scenes in the people, the people who knew the, you know, what had really happened. It would have been in chaos, you know. And again, the idea of just allowing civilians in who might have known something of it so they could take a few pictures, again, that doesn't make sense, you know. And you brought up a very good point, too. I would think that anybody who wasn't sworn a, a, an oath to keep the secret, they, of course they would show it, especially if something like after you see the Roswell Daily Record, flying saucer found, you know, with that being in your memory 10, 20, 30 years later, if you came across this slide, wouldn't you think that anybody would have shown it to anybody and then they come forward just like you said? 
And then going back to the fact that these were found in the 90s, well, where were they for 40 years or 40? Well, reportedly they were stored in like a kind of like a wooden chest sort of thing. But they were the, the actual number of slides, uh, I think, is in the hundreds from this couple, Bernard and Hilda Ray. But reportedly the two slides of the body um, were sort of tucked away in a, in a compartment and, and hidden. Um, or at least hidden from the rest, you know, where they weren't easily found. And it was only when somebody, you know, was checking out the entire case thing that they actually found these other pictures. Where somebody had taken steps to hide them, which, which again, is interesting. Um, and the Rays didn't have children, so you could make the argument there's nobody to pass them down to, that kind of thing. Um, so it, so it, the story could be true. The problem is, you know, we just, at this stage, we don't know everything. And um, to whether we'll know everything tomorrow or some things will still be held back, I, I just, you know, I guess we'll find out tomorrow. <laughs> That's right. And, and like you said, wh- whether we know everything tomorrow, I think that the beginning of, of the questions will just begin tomorrow once this finally hits public domain. Now, because I've only seen one of them and it's a little blurry enough where you can make out what's in it enough where you could see enough details and i've never seen the other one i was hoping since you've actually seen the the slides themselves without being blurred can you describe in detail both of them oh no sorry i should no the only ones i've seen are the ones on the internet okay so you've seen the same yeah it's just the same slide that everybody's seen where you can see like the head on the left and it kind of angles down to, you know, the, the feet on the right-hand side. Yeah, I, I've seen that one, which is which is blurry, but apparently the the other slide and that one, that the, the first-generation ones are supposed to be significantly clearer. And I'm assuming that maybe they're up now, you know. I'm not sure what time the event was going on in Mexico tonight, but, you know, they might already be online, the really clear ones, and um, we might have some sort of indication as to what the, the writing is, by now, um, I'm not. I, I truly can't remember under what circumstances the the fuzzy one surfaced. Whether it was by mistake or somebody put them out there or, or what happened. But uh, um, from everybody I've spoken to who was involved in this hacking thing, it, it's pretty clear that the main go- the main, main reason I think why me, Tony Regalia, and Rich Reynolds were hacked. And I should stress when the hacking occurred, no damage was done. That was the interesting thing. The person was clearly just looking around. And I think what it was, whoever was doing it had possibly assumed that me, Rich, and Tony Brigalia had copies of the images, whether degraded or good quality, on our laptops. None of us actually did. You know, I was, yeah, I was given the name of the rays and, you know, background on what the picture showed. But, you know, the first time I saw that one blurry image was just a couple of months ago. I'd never seen any of the images at all before that and neither had rich that was that was the first time either of us saw it but that is what i think was going on it was like a fishing expedition on the part of the hacker to to try and figure out if anybody had it and for whatever reason and um and of course you know the fact that the hacking even occurred in the first place um is is sort of something that's almost unheard of in ufology you know somebody actually hacking the computer of a UFO researcher to to find you know this material. Now, yeah, I guess you could argue it happens all the time. The big, the only reason any of us knew was because the hacker, as I said, who went under the name of A Glass Darkly, the hacker announced himself, you know, by actually sending emails to us. He actually had the nerve to send emails. What was happening? To give you an example, me and Rich Reynolds would email back and forth to each other about the slides. The hacker would then CC us on his own email, actually talking about the stuff that we had sent privately to each other. So he was clearly reading our emails and kind of replied in like a goading fashion. Now, maybe he's trying to scare us. I don't know, but, you know, I don't scare easy. And what he did to me just got me mad to the point where I was just ready to, like, contact the FBI and, you know, set their, um, I guess, computer fraud. Um uh, department onto it and I looked all this up extensively on the internet who to contact and everything else but then the email address was shut down and the hacker was gone and the you know you've got to deal with Israel and everything else and um, it was like a, a huge thing and um, 
But you know, it van- the whole thing came to an end as as weirdly and as oddly as it began. So. That's I, ironic. The uh, the fact Israel. I'm glad you this came up into the topic, and I've always wondered this: the fact that the U.S. has severely backed them in almost any endeavor. Uh, we keep our nuclear weapons there. We trained the Mossad. Do you think that? Uh, this again, this is 100 percent pure speculation. The fact that we were talking early on in the show that this clandestine organization that answers to nobody, uh, do you think maybe it really moved off the continental U.S. and maybe is sitting somewhere in Israel? And that's why uh, things are originating from there? Well, I mean, I guess you could make that on one argument. The, the only thing I kind of have against that argument is if it was some intelligence, overseas intelligence agency or something like that, I don't believe they would need to hide behind a safe mail account. You know, they would just they just penetrate your system in the way that, you know, sophistic, sophisticated intelligence agencies can do it today. You know, they don't need to, to contact you or cover their tracks by using safe mail, you know, because that would potentially open them up to where you could contact SafeMail and then have... What actually happened was that Tony Bregalia contacted SafeMail, explained the situation, and SafeMail shut down the guy's account. They they literally shut it down. You know, and that if it was an intelligence agency, that wouldn't happen, and they said they wouldn't even need to use SafeMail. So unless they wanted to make it look just like it was a, a regular hacker and not something, you know, more suspicious. So you can, you can I guess, it affect go down that pathway as well that tracks were covered by masquerading as just some acne riddled teenage ufologist you know who's good on computers and decided to go looking for the pictures you know what i mean which i don't think it was somebody like that but i do think you know it could have been somebody in ufology who overstepped the mark but if that's what but on the other hand you know using safe mail setting all this up taunting people and et cetera, et cetera. That's a hell of a long way to go for a UFO researcher to do something like that, you know. That's actually what gets to me the, the most is the fact that not only were they hacking your account and, and Ben's account, the, or Rich's account, the, the fact that really they thumbed their nose at you by CCing the emails between the two of you. I mean, yeah. who, do, who does that? I, I just, you know, not the, the hacking group Anonymous. When they do their hacking, do they make it known, uh, aside from the fact when they want to publicly do something? No, you would, that's the whole point of being anonymous. Yeah, and I think, you know, this, this, why this was so odd was because it really was unprecedented um, in terms of the UFO community. Um, this, this, was, I should, this was last summer, I forget the actual month, but it was July or August, something like that, and it went on for a couple of weeks in total, sporadically, on and off. Um, Now, it's clear to me, I mean, the the hacker never revealed anything about the slides, just commented on them and made sort of oblique, cryptic statements. Uh, And it was done, obviously, like, you know, I think it was done, one thing, to sort of goad, and number two, to let people know, hey, you know, we're watching you, whoever they are. And number three, it was done to try and instill fear. Well, it didn't instill fear, it instilled anger, you know. Um, and it, in terms of the goading and taunting, well, I don't fall for that. I don't play games like that, you know. If you've got something to say, say it to me. Um, and if you say it in person, you know, you better have your boxing gloves on. You know? <laughs> and you know what? I would have had the same reaction to the anger. Nick Redford, please hang tight. Everybody out there listening, I hope you're really enjoying this as much as we are. I see Wise Frog is digging this show. Hang tight. We are taking a quick three-minute break. We'll be right back. We'll talk about Contact in the Desert, pick up on this topic, and announce the next winner. Everybody stay tuned. Welcome back to Hour 2 of Dr. J Radio Live. Of course, I am your host, Dr. J, and we have been speaking to Nick Redfern, a fantastic show, speaking about the Roswell Slides. We have so much more for you. First, a little business. Last Tuesday's show is already up, split up in two separate parts. Timothy Good is one video. Dan Willis is the other video. Last Thursday's show, Michael Cremo is still not up, but it should be up by tomorrow. 
as will tonight's. It'll be up by the end of this week. Now, the winner, the 13th winner, that's right, you heard me. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 winners so far to contact in the desert. Tonight's winner is Sandra Martinez. Sandra Martinez, congratulations. We hope to see you there. I know several of you out there have won uh, direct listeners who tweet. Uh, for instance, I see right here, Lou Sheehan. Uh, he's won and he was the one I gave congratulations to, who I know is going to be there because he's not that far, as will I, as will Mr. Redfern. And of course, with that being said, don't forget we still have the contest running where we have at least four more tickets to give away. All you have to do is go to contactinthedesert.com slash drj, Dr. J. Contact in desert.com slash capital D, lowercase r, capital J. Remember, the caps do count. Capital D, lowercase r, capital J. And with that being said, let's bring back our guest, Mr. Redfern. Nick, welcome back. Thanks. Thanks again. Well, le- since I brought up contact in the desert, I uh-huh. figured let's let's give people a little preview of what you're going to be giving your lecture about. What you if I'm not mistaken, you're doing three things, right? A lecture, a workshop, and yeah. a panel? Yeah, the um, Saturday, excuse me, on the Friday morning, um, this is the last week ending uh, in May, uh, this is at Joshua Tree, contact in the desert, Joshua Tree, California. Um, I'll be speaking in my lecture on the Friday morning. I'll be speaking all about the whole issue of how the contactee movement in the 1950s were, were actually closely watched by various intelligence agencies, worldwide intelligence agencies, um, Australia, the UK, and the US. Um, this includes people like George Adamski, George Van Tassel, and some of the not quite as well-known um, contactees like George Hunt Williamson, Truman Bethram, George King of the Ethereum Society. And many of the files on these people have now been declassified under the terms of the Freedom of Information Acts of various countries. And they actually tell a really interesting story about how, you know, at the same time as people like the Air Force were studying and investigating UFO sightings, um, these agencies were actually very closely monitoring the contactees and their claims of interaction with aliens who wanted us to disarm our nukes and things like this. And uh, it's sort of a fascinating bit of sort of Cold War history. So that'll be the subject of the lecture. Then on the Friday evening, I'm doing a workshop um, on the whole theory of, you know, were the, the stones of like Stonehenge and the pyramids of Egypt and the similar pyramids in uh, South America and, and other massive structures, were they built and were the stones moved by something along the lines of like acoustic levitation, which is an interesting theory, in a, in, for want of a better term, uh, like anti-gravity. A lot of rumors and ancient legends of the stones being sort of magically lifted into the air. So following like a workshop type style, I'll be sort of presenting information and data and images that talk about um, what anti-gravity is and, you know, sort of get into that whole aspect and and you know have sort of like an interaction with the audience and demonstrate to them what it is and how it works and how it might be applied in you know the issue of moving these massive blocks then saturday morning um this is going to be essentially i think just like a straightforward ufo panel on whatever people want to talk about but this is going to be outside in the auditorium in the amphitheater i should say um it's the contact in the desert site and i think there's going to be five or six of us taking part in this panel and which which should be good you know i like doing um panel discussions and getting audience interaction i actually prefer that to just a straightforward you know 90 minute lecture to the audience or lecture at the audience you know i like to get feedback and open it up to questions and debate because I think I think people like that they like the interaction and you know see where it's all going to lead and um, so that'll be basically the my sort of three contributions uh, contacting the desert I'm actually glad you brought up the the, the 50s movement I learned something from Timothy Good, which I'm hoping you can expand, which blew my mind because over the years I see the Adamski footage. And when I was back in the 80s, first I believed it. Then came the 90s and I was like, well, human looking ETs, how can they be human looking? I mean, this is, I was, didn't know any better. So I 
sort of rubbed off the case when I saw the picture of the Venusians that visited him. And then, of course, you have so many more research that have come forward validating the story. Now, what Timothy Good told me, which blew my socks off, was that George Adamski was issued a U.S. ordinance card, and he routinely visited the White House, the Vatican, and other heads of states. Did you know about that? Well, I've heard rumors of that, but I've never actually seen proof of it. Um, you know, um, I mean, a lot, Adamski did have a lot of significant people who followed him. You know, he was, he was without doubt, regardless of what you think of him, he was sort of the leader of the contactee movement and really defined that era and defined what a contactee was. And, he, and as I said, he did have a lot of influential people who believed in and followed him. For example, I mean, the Duke of Edinburgh, you know, the Queen Elizabeth's husband in the UK, I mean, he was heavily influenced in the 50s by flying saucer books and the works of people like Adamski. You know, he, he owned copies of the books and at one point um, used to subscribe to Flying Saucer Review magazine. So we know, you know, that Adamski really was somebody who turned a lot of influential heads. I've never personally seen anything about him going to the White House or the Vatican. Um, but, you know, what I would say, he was the subject of quite an extensive FBI file. Um, he was monitored by the Australian security services when in uh, the late 50s he travelled to Australia and went on like a lecture tour around various cities. And um, he's also mentioned in a number of British police files. There's a, a department of the British police force called Special Branch, and they opened um, files on various contactees, and not particularly the Aetherius Society and on George King, who founded the Aetherius Society. And Adamski is mentioned like, as an aside in some of those files. So, um, you know, I think there's still a bigger picture of of what Adamski's links to, you know, the official world were. I think there's still a lot of that to come out. You know, we actually, I have a question for you, but I, we do have a caller, so I'm going to yield my question. And actually, if I'm not mistaken, I recognize this ah. caller as the winner, Lou Sheehan. Correct. That's right. <laughs> Lou, welcome to the show. Do you have any uh, questions or comments for Nick? I do. I also have a, a slight, I'll call it cold. It's a lung condition. But every now and then I have to cough, so I apologize in advance. Um, hold on. Bless you. Um, pardon. Thank you. Um, I, what the, my main interest is, but I have a subsidiary question because you're talking about FBI files. So my main question for Nick is why I, it's a standard one that I always like to hear people who are prominent in the industry talk about. For example, Peter uh, Robbins talked about having seen a UFO. Why has Nick, and I'm just, pretty much just interested in UFOs. Has Nick seen a UFO? What's, why does he have an interest in ufology? That's my main question. But if uh, the other question, if I may, just because you mentioned UFO files, and I've seen Corso's UFO file, and it makes me very skeptical of Mr. Corso. I'm curious if Nick has any comments about that as well. And I'm going to yeah, just sure listen to you off the air if you don't mind. Okay. Yeah, well, no problem. Maybe I'll hold okay, on. Thanks. Go ahead. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, well, well yeah, uh, Lou Brett raises two big questions, you know, because we all have a reason as to why we got involved in UFOs. Um, a lot of people, it is because they've had like a really profound personal encounter. That actually hasn't happened for me, although, you know, maybe maybe one day. But why I got interested is that my dad was in the British Royal Air Force. He was a radar mechanic, and he was involved... Um, in three nights of UFO encounters in September 52, where essentially like fleets of UFOs were tracked incoming from, um, from Europe um, eastwards towards um, the, excuse me, uh, westerly towards um, the UK coastline. And whatever these things were, they clearly weren't Soviet bombers or fighter planes. They were performing all sorts of strange maneuvers and high-speed turns and hovering at, you know, multiple thousands of feet. And uh, Royal Air Force fighter planes were scrambled to try and intercept these things. The pilots um, got visual contact of what they described as like extremely bright, almost dazzling lights. Um, flitting across the skies, I actually played games of cat and mouse with the air crews, where eventually they mm. were forced to return to base because they were lo running low on fuel. This happened mm. over three nights, and everybody was told, you know, you won't talk about this at all. 
uh, states islands and everybody's reminded that they've signed the British military's official secrets act which is basically a piece of legislation that you know if you reveal government secrets you can get in, in major trouble and this was 52 and my dad didn't tell me this till um, late 1970s when I was just a kid and it sort of opened my eyes not just because you know my, it was my own dad but also because he was somebody who worked in the military and was trained on radar to know how to interpret radar mm. screens and, you know, what they show. Um, now, what it was, nobody knew, or what they were, I should say, but that really got me interested. And, you know, from then I began reading books from people like John Keel and Brad Steiger and Charles Berlitz and people like that. And sort of mm -hmm. took it from there. And, and my dad still talks about it to this day. He's, he's 83 mm -hmm. later this month, and it's still as clear in his mind then. He, you know, to his credit, he doesn't elaborate on it. He just says, well, all I say for sure is that we were tracking things that <laughs> outperformed anything that any military body in the world had at that time, you know. And um, now, There was a, another thought, man who recently, uh, recently came out with a He told us, he said way back when in England he was ordered to I think it would shoot them down. Is, is yeah. there, has anybody else talked about the one that your father's has seen? I'm just oh, trying yeah, to see if it's the occurred, same thing. Yeah. It actually occurred at the height of a NATO exercise called Main Brace, oh. M-A-I-N-B-R-A-C-E. Now, if you Google mm -hmm. UFO or flying saucer plus uh, exercise Main Brace, you'll find mm -hmm. that there are actually dozens of encounters over this period in September 52 when the the NATO exercise was going on in the English Channel and the North Sea. And uh, there were radar tracks mm -hmm. at other bases and pilots have come forward and all sorts of different things. So you can, I think you can actually find my um, dad's account on, online where I, I wrote it. Wow. So, yeah. And then, and then, sorry to interrupt you, if you're, you were going to say something else and then to the course of the FBI file. Yeah, Lou, I interrupted about, you. Uh, no, that's no problem. Lou's asked about um, Corso's file. Now, Corso, Philip, Colonel Philip Corso, wrote the, with Bill Burns the book The Day After Roswell. Now, why this, this book came out in 97, ironically, the summer of 97, which is the same time, the exact same time that the Air Force put out its reports saying that mm -hmm. the bodies were crash test dummies. And you know, Corso's book came out at the same time saying the bodies were aliens. Why the book stood out for a lot of people was and why it got a lot of major media coverage and became a big seller was because Corso, you know, was who he claimed to be. You know, he, he held the position he claimed to have held in the U.S. military and, um, you know, a fairly significant guy, done a lot of um, work in the military. The problem was that he told a story that was highly controversial. The idea that near single-handedly he secretly seeded um, technology recovered from the Roswell crash into U.S. industry to sort of further and kickstart U.S. technologies. Um, now, I would be the first to admit that that is a logical thing we would do. But if we're faced with alien technology that is sort of infinitely far more advanced than ours, possibly even to the point where it's almost incomprehensible, I kind mm -hmm. of find it hard to believe that if this was recovered in '47 that so quickly we'd be able to trans you know, create our own versions of like fiber optics, night vision, transistors, everything else that the Corso said came from Roswell. I think it would take us far more than a few years. I think it would take us possibly decades or even longer. Um, and of course, you know, people have asked questions as to whether or not Corso had exaggerated his uh, position and the work he did and things like this. And there's actually an FBI file on him as well, which has been declassified. Yeah, which yeah. Is that, yeah, that isn't actually particularly flattering in terms of presenting no, him in a good no. light. You know, it's, in fact, mm. it's the exact opposite as someone mm. who was sort of telling stories and all sorts of things. So, you know, this is why... I think Corso's story is interesting, but I am, uh, people ask me, I'm highly skeptical of Corso's mm -hmm, story. Mm -hmm. Now, if it isn't true, the bigger question, the one that doesn't often get asked is, you know, what would be the motivation uh, in his early to mid 80s to put the book out and put himself through what was clearly, you know, surely would have anticipated there would have been a huge, you know, uh, backlash or even at least commentary where 
people were going to question him and put him on the spot and demand answers. It'd be a stressful thing to put yourself through it, you know. You know, speaking of what you just said about Corso, I'm actually, I, I, that, I've raised that same question in my head. Would it be possible for us to reverse engineer something so quickly? And this past UFO Congress, Bob Lazar said something that really resonated for me when George Knapp asked him, have we reverse engineered any of these craft? And he basically said, hell no. And he said it would be akin to taking an iPhone dropping it into a wagon train in the 19th century and said, here, produce a couple more of these. Yeah. Anyway, I yeah, just... Well, yeah, no, you're right. And the problem is, well, one thing that a lot of people do forget is it's not just understanding the technology, it's, it's replicating it. Now, if, mm-hmm. what I mean by that, let's say, for example, you know, um, somebody created a time machine and were able to, like, a, like Back to the Future, and sent a DeLorean back to, say, the 17th century. Well, um... The people who found it would see that it had wheels, you know, it'd be like one of their horse and carts that they drive around, it had wheels, and they'd probably, you know, if they opened the doors, which they would probably figure out how to do in five minutes if they weren't locked, you know, you just pick the handle up and the door opens, and they would sit in it, and they would turn the wheel, the steering wheel, and they would, somebody outside would see that as they turn the steering wheel that the tyres turn, and they would figure out that it was a, something to move along in. Now, even if they figured all that out, and if there was a key and they turned the key and the engine rumbled to life, and they figured out how to drive it and move the gears, which they probably could do that. But the problem is, when that vehicle runs out of gas, and this is, say, the 1600s, there would be no way to replicate the gas to refill the tank. Do you see what I mean? You could understand Mm -hmm. the basic working, but gasoline didn't exist then as it does today. So that's the issue I have. I'm not saying that scientists by 10 years after the Roswell crash occurred that they might not have understood some of the technologies. They might have done. But if the technology is so advanced and you're unable to replicate the power system or the the metal or, the, or whatever, that's a stumbling block. It's the same analogy with, you know, sending a car back to the 1600s and you can't replicate oil for the engine. No, his, his FBI file his FBI file is, is almost derogatory. I oh, I also am aware derogatory. Oh yeah. I I'll send it to you, Dr. J if you haven't seen it. Well actually um, yeah I haven't. Go 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 ahead. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, it's it's a bad, bad long thing. Um I also am aware that he claims to have subsequently seen aliens and communicated with them and had messages from them. And when someone goes that kind of far off the uh, I may say deep end. I re- my antenna really go up. I mean, that's just for me and Doctor and uh, Colonel Corso. But I was curious what Nick. Yeah, I mean, there's doing. also stuff, so, in, as I'm sure you know, in the FBI file where you know they're talking about the Kennedy assassination and Corso mm-hmm. making claims about that as well. Um, you know, I mean, um, that we, Oswald we was a CIA. That Oswald was a CIA plan. Yeah, I mean, was, we don't know what the truth yeah. of. The Kennedy assassination is any more than we know as it was in relation to Roswell. But what I would say Mm -hmm. is that, you know, I am highly, highly skeptical of the story, but I am intrigued as to who would put themselves Mm -hmm. through that at like 81 and why. You know, I mean, I know enough about the book publishing industry to know that unless you're like a really major, like J.K. Rowling or Stephen King, you know, the book industry Mm -hmm. doesn't pay massive amounts of writing books. You know, I do because I enjoy it. Right. But, you know, I'm never going to be driving around in a Ferrari. You know what I mean? Um, well, and, and, also, and also he lost money with the lawsuit subsequently. I, certainly, I mean, lost yeah. in the sense he had to expend money. He had a lawsuit with yeah. the Burns couple. So, yeah, I mean, and, as you say, there wasn't much money in it. No, and, and you know, and I mean, he died the year after the book came out. He died in 98, mm-hmm. and his book came out in 97. You know, so it's not like he lived long to see much. So, uh you know, Corso's, Corso and his story are like an enigma because he kind of, none of it makes sense in terms of motivations. Either he was, either it was true or he was just somebody who wanted to, you know, impact on Roswell and before he's dying, leave a, a fantastic story and be spoken about for the next hundred years or whatever. Well, I have more to say about Mr. Corso, but what I, what I will say is there's another book for you, Nick. You can write about what, what people's motivations are for coming up with these stories. So I'm looking forward to reading it. 
Well, you understand what I'm saying? I'm teasing you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. I will send you that that file, Doctor J. Thank and you. Thanks Lou. for uh, your show. Uh, Nick, one thing I forgot to ask you for when we came back from break, uh, totally selfish of me, is where can people find you? I know you have a blog. I and Yeah. Well, there's a couple of ways people can reach. I have a blog, which is um, Nick Redfern Fortean, F-O-R-T-E-A-N, F-O-R-T-E-A-N, Nick Redfern Fortean dot blogspot dot com. And I try and update that blog most days with all my sort of major interests, UFOs and Bigfoot and cryptozoology and things like that and um and there's a contact section there which will take people to my facebook page and you can either you know send me a request or send me a message and uh you know i'm always happy to chat with people if they've got any questions or they want to share information or want advice on something you know just just fire me a request as i say or send a message and i check facebook a couple of times a day so um you know, that, that, or people can uh, reach me on Twitter as well. So Facebook, Twitter, or, or at the blog. The question I had going right before Lou called, when you were talking about Prince Philip, uh, being Greek, of course, I'm very, we're very fascinated and proud of him because we're such a small country. And for a fellow Greek to marry the Queen of England, or at the time being a, the princess, is, of course, fascinating. I didn't know that he had a fascination with UFOs. So my question is this. Do you think, again, pure speculation, that the royal family knows and the reason why Prince Philip is reading things such as Flying Saucer Review is to see what we know? Or are they also cut out of the loop and he's just fishing for the Um, information just like us? Well, I mean, I I can't be sure where things are today. But I think back in the 50s, I think... Prince Philip genuinely didn't know and, and wanted to find out. I mean, I'll give you an example. There was a guy now, he's now dead named Sir Peter Horsley, and he was a major figure in the British military. And at one point, he was like one of the British equivalents of the guys over here who, in the event of a war, you know, he would be the guy with his finger on the red button, you know, ready to launch the missiles at the Russians. That, that was how senior he was. Now, Sir Peter Horsley wrote a book a couple of years before he died talking about how... Um, Prince Philip had essentially um, quietly asked him to do some investigations on on his behalf to find out what the truth was about UFOs. And Peter Horsley said that um, he, um, you know, went looking here and there, looking for information, and passed it back on to Prince Philip because he was very interested. Now, what's really weird is, given that Sir Peter Horsley, you know, Sir Peter Horsley wasn't like Corso, you know, somebody with a controversial background who may have overemphasized, etc. So Peter Horsley, if you look him up, H-O-R-S-L-E-Y, he really was, you know, um, a major figure in the British Ministry of Defense, which is like the equivalent of the U.S. Defense Department over here. Um, He was the guy with his finger on the red button um, and major, major figure. He actually said that in the 1950s, he met with a human-like alien at an apartment in London uh, a man that called himself Mr. Janus, and who essentially it was like a contactee thing where Mr. Janus said to Sir Peter Horsley, you know, you need to lay all your nuclear weapons down and live in peace, otherwise we're going to, you know, in, intrude and do something about it. You know, this was like, this was no different to George Adamski going out in the desert and meeting Orthon or George Van Tassel out of Giant Rock saying he met long-haired space aliens. So Peter Horsley said he met this Mr. Janus, an alien, in a London apartment, which sounds bizarre. But, you know, the, the fact is Sir Peter Horsley had the credentials. And so, you know, it's a fascinating but really bizarre, outrageous story at the same time. But you also hear similar things in the U.S. I, I forget Val Thor. That's that's the name. Val Thor as was apparently an ET yeah, in the Pentagon. Yeah, yeah, that's the story. Franz Stranges uh, wrote the book Stranger in the Pentagon um, about this guy named Valiant Thor, uh, like a Venusian who had infiltrated the Pentagon. And um, I mean, I mean, I've spoken to and know of a lot of really qualified people who were in the military in the back in the 50s, and some of them haven't gone record, but, you know, I can, I can tell you they are, are who they claim to be. And they said that there were human-looking aliens back then sort of infiltrating us and trying to influence us. And, um, you know, terms like infiltration and influence 
take on kind of sinister tones, you know. And, and certainly if you look back at some of these old Space Brother stories, they do come across as a bit a bit sort of bullying and fascist-like, you know. Uh, they good intentions, but there's always this sort of angle of, well, should we trust them or not, you know. And um, kind of like in the day the Earth stood still uh, movie, Michael Rennie's character, um, how he ostensibly, you know, said, well, you've got to disarm your nuclear weapons and live in peace because you're a violent race. And he tries to emphasize that. But there's always this, he has this kind of cold, detached aspect. Well, if you don't do it, you know, it's it's going to be to the uh, regret of everybody on the planet. And um, so I, I don't rule out. I mean, people think I... I wouldn't be the sort of person to accept the contactee accounts, but I've, I've got a big fascination for the contactee movement and history, and I think I think they did have interaction with something. You know, you also have more interesting theories that, like the late Mactonis came up with the idea of what he called crypto terrestrials, like an ancient terrestrial race living in stealth here on the Earth alongside us, and perhaps they were like the original, if you like. Um, people of the earth and perhaps like an offshoot of the human race and uh, we've infested the planet and you know the idea is that Matt came up with was that the crypto terrestrials present themselves as extraterrestrial to hide who they really are but the reason they want us to disarm our nukes is because they're forced to share the planet with this warlike race namely us and so they try and subtly influence us from destroying us ourselves because if we do that we're going to destroy them as well so you know the the crypto terrestrial theory the idea of you know the ufo phenomenon masquerading as extraterrestrial to prevent people finding out it's ancient and terrestrial is sort of an engaging and an, and an interesting one you know i definitely love that theory and jason martell a few weeks ago when he was on this very same night was talking uh about that he believes that a lot of the ancient sites were exactly that, that they were terrestrials that were not quite human, but were, like you said, crypto terrestrials, and, and they sort of d receded and, and underground or in different places. And, of course, you have a lot of these Native American Indians in, in South America, North America, talking about seeing them in caves. There's a, a fascinating book I have, Weird California, and it has nothing to oh, do yeah. with UFOs. Uh, you've heard of it, right? And yeah. there, one specific story really struck out in my mind. In the 30s, when they were building, looking for gold in Los Angeles, literally in downtown Los Angeles, they found a network of caves that had lizard people. And they scared them so bad that they ended up sealing up those caves forever. And, of course, again, this is in weird California. How can we verify it? Then you hear multiple stories of, of things being found underground. Then you have the Admiral Byrd story. Uh, what other crypto terrestrial stories have you heard? And and do you know of the different species or are they all the all the all we think all to be extraterrestrial actually be crypto terrestrials? Well, I mean, it, it's an interesting theory, and there are actually several things that are in its favor. One is the fact that you know, most of these aliens that we see, whether the Greys or the Space Brothers of the 50s, you know, they seem to operate quite happy in our atmosphere and our oxygen levels. You know, it's almost as if it's too good to be true unless they were already from here. The other thing, of course, is that if you look at alien abductions, primarily the, the, the sole focus and goal is like a genetic experiments, many of which sort of re related to like reproduction. And you hear of like eggs, uh, sperm, DNA extracted and taken from the abductees. Now, I would think that, I mean, no one could say for sure, but the idea of a race of entities coming from, a, you know, however many galaxies away, however many light years away, and our DNA, eggs and sperm being so compatible that they can splice it with theirs. To me, that kind of stretches credibility. I would see it more likely that the, or a bit more believable that abductions would be done by ancient crypto terrestrials who really can work with human DNA, etc., because we share an ancient lineage, even if we're not, even if there are some differences, we share an ancient lineage that allows for our DNA, our sperm, our eggs, 
to be utilised and manipulated by them. That makes more. That sounds more believable than, as I said, people coming from 50 light years away, and they find that we're all genetically compatible. That that to me kind of stretches things a bit. I am actually really glad you brought that up because I meant to ask you something uh, last hour when we were talking about DNA. If we were to find a true alien body, let's just say we were to locate this, what was in the Roswell slide, and we realize, okay, it's, it was a living creature at some time. It's definitely biological. And then we test the DNA. And let's just say, you know, chimps have 98% DNA, somewhere in that range. This had yeah. 70% human DNA. Would people write it off as, oh, well, this is just uh, us genetically modifying a human? Mm. Or would this fit into the theory that you just said, that they were mm. another race living on this earth that were compatible enough to essentially create us or off? shoots of us and the hence the theory of uh, what other people say that we are essentially homo sapiens just a giant hybrid race what do you think about that well yeah i mean there's there's lots of different ways to look at it i mean you can go back into history and find you know stories of like the the people of atlantis and things like this now i suspect that atlantis is probably just like a genetic mythological name for like inherited legends and stories which probably do have a basis in fact of perhaps cultures, highly advanced cultures that came before us and that became extinct in the same way that think the same thing might happen to us and then 20,000 years later when civilization starts to build up again, there are these legends of, of us and people write them off as just myth, you know. So that could have happened. Maybe civilization comes in cycles every, you know, 50,000 years or whatever. Um, so I think that's a possibility. But any sort of DNA that matches ours opens up sort of a huge can of worms for whoever's doing the investigations and probably would be one of the prime reasons why the secret would be kept. And rather ironically, I think you could make a good case that, yes, the existence of extraterrestrial life might be hidden from us if it was proved, you know, from a crash or something like that. But equally, if some agency of government proved that deep underground there are, like, ancient humanoids, original sort of, you know, the original people or creatures of the planet, and they're infesting the lower levels of the planet, that might be an even bigger reason to hide it from people, you know. That might be seen as even more disturbing, that there are creatures more advanced than us, far older than us, living deep underground. And essentially, we cannot control the lower levels of the planet. Um, and it's, um, also, essentially, we're keeping away from them because we're fearful of what's going on down there. That might be seen as opening an even bigger can of worms. And ironically, it might prompt the intelligence agencies to actually promote the UFO alien theory to veer people away from what they see as an even more troublesome truth. I agree with you wholeheartedly in that if humans, the human population as a whole, was to find out that we had something more intelligent, older, l here on Earth, longer than us, uh, of course we'd be scared. Uh, we'd be scared in so many possible ways that you would think that the uh, that they would promote the UFO theory because wouldn't it be easier to believe that something is coming from somewhere else and visiting us than actually have been living with us the entire time? Yeah, and I think people, I, I mean, I don't blame people for this because I think your natural assumption is if you see a strange craft and you, it's associated with an unusual looking humanoids, with our pop culture and history of sci-fi movies and TV and everything else, your natural assumption is that it's extraterrestrial. Now, of course, that might be the perfect cover for whatever these things are. Um, you know, and I, what I find interesting is if you go down the path that like Jacques Vallée has gone, where he drew parallels with how some of, or a lot actually, I should say, of today's abduction stories, sound like upgraded versions of how people 500 years ago in England and other parts of Europe would get kidnapped by little dwarfish fairies and goblins taken to the fairy kingdom where they would have to meet, mate with the fairy queen and when they come back, you know, they were missing a day when they thought an hour had gone by. You've got all the staple aspects of abductions. And I wonder if, if the crypto-terrestrial theory has merit, maybe these things change 
you know, or promoted their identity as something to fit in that was believable to the people of the day. You know, so they would act as demons 2,000 years ago in ancient Babylonia, you know, present themselves as demons, then as goblins, then as space brothers, then as the greys. You know, it's like they're constantly modifying themselves to hide behind the camouflage themselves behind the belief systems of the people of that particular era, you know. And if perhaps 50 years from now, time travel's the big thing people believe in, suddenly they'll pretend to be time travellers. You know, it acts as another layer of the camouflage to confuse what they really are. You just brought up, a, a triggered a memory of a fascinating story I heard. This was sometime in the 19th century. Uh, I don't know where, and I don't recall where I heard this, but... Some, I, I, if I'm not mistaken, I read this in UFO magazine at the time that you were submitting your uh, You From a Brit articles. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. But the story was that somebody saw what looked like a train with strange looking beings on there. And they asked them, uh, you know, something along the lines of what kind of brakes are those? Because they sounded sort of weird. And the, the being said, oh, these are air brakes. And just like you said, camouflaging in the era, I thought. Wow, a perfect I- idea. Going back, you know, like you said, to, from the goblins, the dwarfs, the fairies, the elves. Well, in the 19th century, why not disguise themselves as a advanced Westerners using better railroads that, or, or trains without railroads? I just thought that was really, really interesting. I have a scenario that I've been laying in my head for over 30 years, and I'm going to ask, I'm going to lay it out to you and ask your opinion. Assume they're going, assuming that, of course, that these human looking extraterrestrials are extraterrestrials and they're flying here and one crashes, right? And all of a sudden, before the military or the clandestine organization can get to that crash site, it is gotten to by civilians and media. Wouldn't it be proper or not proper? That's the wrong word. Wouldn't it be more likely that the media and the skeptics would say, see, they're human looking? Therefore, they're humans. And all the UFOs that you've been seeing, the flying saucers, they're all ours. Do you think that would be the case? Well, I mean, if if you're dealing with something like the Space Brothers of the 50s, I mean, they were a lot of those were supposedly, you know, so human looking that they could walk amongst us and not be noticed as any difference. You know, I mean, that was a whole story of people like Frank Strangers and George Van Tassel that, um, you know, they... Some of the other people said they looked slightly different, like Truman Bathroom said they were small and olive-coloured, but um, the rest were saying that they could have passed for us. You know, the, the big difference with the Space Brothers was that they had long hair. Now, of course, not many guys had long hair in the 50s. You know, it was it was short hair and fedora hats and suits. That, kind of, that was the style. So you probably would look twice if you saw a guy walking down... New York City with hair down to his shoulders in 1953. You know, people would look twice at that. Today, we don't give it a second thought. Um, so there is that angle um, that they, if the stories are true, that they probably really could mingle amongst us. And, you know, if they were found at a crash site, you would naturally assume, yep, they're ours. Um, obviously, that's going to be less so if it's something like the Greys or, or something in between that but um yeah i think our perceptions on who's flying source flying the ufos or flying the flying saucers is based on the descriptions of the creatures or the beings that are reported in you know in in the cases if they were all human like i think a lot of people would have suspicions that well yeah this is just a military program but you know the, the fact that people talk about these dwarfish greys that really does just by default push people down you know, the ET paths. Exactly. And that's why I was laying that foundation or that scenario in my head that I would think that if it was human looking extraterrestrials, that the skeptics and the media can say, ah, there's this, this the mystery is solved. It's always been us. But had it been the greys or the reptilians or the insectoids or any of those other ones, then it's a different story. Now, on yeah. the topic of crash and retrievals, we have so many cases in the United States. Then you have the China case, I believe, was it 10,000 years old, that drop of stones. Then you hear about the Soviet Union, Kapustin Yar. But in the UK, we have the Rendlesham Landing, which I think is probably one of the more important cases because you had a lot of witnesses and it's far more recent. But do you know of any crash and retrievals in the UK? 
Yeah, there's actually a few stories. I mean, there's one really interesting one that I uh, investigated in 1996. And uh, I grew up in an area of central England, uh, which is like a very heavily forested area. And just about a 15-minute drive from where I lived, there was a large, or there still is a large area of forest called the Cannock Chase. Now, it's certainly not big, you know, in terms of uh, U.S. forests. Uh, it's a, but it's like a large woodland. It's about 28 square miles, and it's been a hotbed for sort of weird activity for, for years and years. Um, and there's a long-standing story of a UFO crash in the Cannock Chase Woods in early uh, 1964, around February or March. And it deals with the crash of like a delta-shaped or triangular-shaped object that reportedly came down and... There's been talk of a military cordon and a police cordon and people being silenced and things like this. And um, at the time, this is 96, when I was looking into it, I was working closely with a group called the Staffordshire UFO Group. Staffordshire is the county in England where the Cannock Chase stands. And um, the woman who ran the group, Irene Bart, who's a good friend of mine, Irene um, put a, an ad in a... Well, not an ad, but she was interviewed for a local newspaper about her research and the case, it actually brought forth a number of people, including uh, people who worked for the fire service and the emergency services who remembered the cordon and parts of the woods being closed down when the retrieval was taking place. And also a guy who said that uh, he was uh, an elderly guy who said he was on the scene um, at the time. And uh, it's one of these stories which is really going to need a lot more uh, research and investigation. But uh, it occurred in a little town called Penkridge, P-E-N-K-R-I-D-G-E, Penkridge. And there's a guy, I forget his name now, but he's actually got a, a blog all about this crash. I think, it's, I think the blog's called the Penkridge UFO Crash, but if you Google that, you'll, you'll find his blog. And he, I don't think it's been updated for about a year, but he uncovered some really interesting data on this particular case of 64. And, and for me, at least, that's the, the one standout case that, that really could have been like a, UFO, a UK UFO retrieval. Crash and retrievals are one of my favorite topics. And the other one is alien abduction, because I think if we're going to get answers, it's not going to be by analyzing footage of what's flying. It's not going to be by uh, secondhand, thirdhand witnesses that were at a military base and saw one dock or something. I think the answers lie with people who have actually interacted with them that can tell us how do they speak to each other? How do they operate their craft or what kind of reasoning do they have or things like that. What's your take on alien abduction? Do you think that's where the answers lie? Well, I think anything where there's interaction. I mean, I made this point. I was actually speaking at a conference uh, this past weekend. It's actually a cryptozoology conference by other big interests like Bigfoot and stuff like that. Uh, but the, the point I made is, is exactly the same. I, I said, you know, that the most important people in the field of cryptozoology are the witnesses, because without the witnesses, we have nothing to go on. And I would apply that to the UFO subject. You know, it's not the researchers or the authors, you know, the TV hosts that count. It's the witnesses, because without them, we've got nothing to go on. And so if a witness has not just a sighting, but has a really profound encounter. And they can perhaps one day hopefully provide something solid and physical from that encounter. Then that would hopefully, you know, blow a lot of doors wide open. Um, you know, those of us who investigate things, well, investigations are vital and it will always need to be done. But it all comes down to the person who had the encounter. So you know, whether it's uh, an abduction and the person claims they've been implanted with something and, you know, we actually do some digging and find an undeniable implant, you know. Um, it's things like that, sort of the alternative things, rather than just analysing photographs and government documents. It's going to take something more to open it up. And I think, you know, the witnesses, because they're on the front line, so to speak, it, it, it probably is going to come from them in some capacity. Speaking of implants, have you ever had a chance to see any of them with Dr. Lear? Yeah, I actually uh, knew uh, Roger Lear quite well because he was often over in the UK lecturing at um, a lot of the conferences I used to go to and became quite good friends with him. And um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the whole implant issue is, is interesting. Um, I guess, I mean, the one thing I understand why the skeptics say this is that, you know, 
they don't all look uniformly the same. They look different and strange, and you know, and uh, people said, well, it's just when you were a kid, somebody fell over and cut their knee and whatever, and you've got a little bit of metal in there. You know, I'm not saying that doesn't happen, but um, I mean, I did see Roger's stuff um, quite extensively. You know, he had this sort of kid, this case of all the different examples, and it was cool to see them, but, uh, you know, I'm not sure to what extent it actually sort of proves anything. I think um, it's an area that is sort of massively under-investigated today, but arguably should be one of the major areas for investigation because if we can prove like a pattern of abductees and then a pattern of implants, then we really are sort of putting the pieces together. So I think really somebody should pick up to a massive degree on what Roger had done because regards what people think about the implants issue, it, people talk about being implanted, so we shouldn't ignore this and um, we might ignore it at our peril. You know, the idea of... Because it does have sort of sinister overtones, you know, implants and tracking us and watching our movements or, you know, maybe checking out even when people move house or whatever, they can find out where you are at any given time. So there's, there are important issues to be addressed from this issue. And the implants, I think, is really fascinating. And you're right. We, we definitely have to investigate longer. I really wish before he passed, there was an apprentice that was working yeah. under him to pick up the work. But I happen to be present at his last surgery. And what blew me away is prior to the removal of the implant, it was emanating radio waves. It was causing things near it to be magnetic, which were to be magnetized, which weren't magnetic to begin with, such as plastic. How can plastic be magnetic? And of course, when this, when they were trying to remove it, it seemed to be moving by itself as if to avoid being removed. Yet when it was removed, there goes the, the, uh, the radio waves. They were no longer there. The magnetism was gone. And I was just, it blew my mind. Uh, now, as Dr. Greer says, these are CIA implants or Dr. Lear says these are alien implants. Whatever they are, they are implants, and they are crazy to, at the very least. That, that's just the, the impression that I came home with. Well, I mean, we know. I mean, obviously, you know. I mean, dogs and cats have implants, and that, that's a that's a positive example of using them. You know, you you lose your pet, and then you're grateful because you got your pet back, and you, your pet's grateful as well. You know, because. Uh, it was seen running around the street, somebody picked it up, or the cops picked it up, he's taken it to the pound, it was scanned, and then they traced it right back to you in, in no time. That's a, that's a good, positive angle. Um, and so we know if we can develop the technology, then sure as hell somebody else can as well. So in that respect, you're right. I mean, it's a shame nobody sort of picked up on Roger's work. And, you know, I would hope maybe even somebody listening would would sort of dig into this and start fresh and new and look at the look at the trends look at the parallels look at the people who claim to have been implanted and then use that as like a template and a plan to take it further and sort of see how this trend spreads over the country in different parts of the country what are people reporting with the implants do they affect them do they affect their minds do they control the person are they just tracking the person you know, there's major questions to be answered here, and it would be it would be good if somebody were to sort of pick up on that work. And Roger's stuff didn't just end up in like a, a limbo. You know? Yes, yeah, exactly. I have one more, kind of a couple more questions on abduction. But actually, I received here a tweet, a question for you. And by the way, we have a little over five minutes left. And I, as always, every time I speak to you, with such a fascinating conversation, we can literally go on for forever and still run out of time. So we absolutely have to do this again soon. But here's the question. It says, uh, consider asking uh, Red, Ms. Nick Redfern what your opinion is of Bob Lazar's stories. What is it? What are they? Oh, well, well, unlike a lot of people in ufology, I don't think Bob Lazar was a hoaxer. Now, you know, people say, well, this story is just nonsense. You know, the idea of this rogue scientist being hired to work out at S4, this part of Area 51, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, one of the things that um, is important is, you know, that Lazar's name does appear in the Los Alamos phone book for 1982. You know, this is this, and the the phone book surfaced after Los Alamos staff flatly denied 
that Lazar ever worked there. Now, Lazar said that the hookup for the interview that got him the job uh, out there was arranged by none other than Dr. Edward Teller, the legendary physicist. And um, and Lazar said that he met with with um, Teller and they chatted all about his work and so on. And he agreed to try and get him on with Area 51. Well, local media in Nevada contacted um, Teller on film and said, you know, this guy Lazar, who said he worked on alien spacecraft at Area 51, said you got him the job or the interview. And if he's, you know, if he's full of it, are you going to take legal action or is it true? And Or is he a liar? And if it is, tell us he's a liar. Teller fumbled and stumbled and refused to actually comment. He refused to say that he'd been essentially like slandered and lied about by Lazar. He said, I'm not going to talk about it. Things like that are intriguing, as is also the fact that Lazar said that, and this makes a great deal of sense, he said that the reason why so little progress has been made is because they're very careful and worried about who they get on board on the program. You know, you get somebody, a major world-renowned scientist, somebody like Stephen Hawking, you know, they may be tempted to blow the whistle. And Lazar said they often go out of their way to hire guys who are brilliant minds but are a bit sort of alternative and rogue and they may have things in their past where if they decide to go public there will be enough material where the people in the program could demolish their credibility and that makes a lot of sense you know you hire someone who's, who's really got a brilliant mind but who also um has something in their background like a skeleton in the closet that can make people question them that would make sense and so that it's things like that um that i that for me like the los alamos phone book the teller issue that keep it still wide open for me in terms of lazar i i really think he's a fascinating figure and i don't think he's hoaxing at all because his story is never waived he's never exaggerated no. anything and he's he's never released a book uh, clearly he's not in this for this money and when he speaks about this. Uh, obviously, he was pulled out of the woodworks for the UFO Congress. He says if he was able to go back in time to 1988, 89, when he started talking about this, he would have kept his mouth shut. He would have never said it because all that's happened to his life and his family's life has been harm. And I don't blame him for that matter. Let me ask you this, though. We only have a few minutes left, so I'm going to pause off the alien abduction questions. And I'm going to pose the same question. Assuming you were in Bob Lazar's position where you were given access to uh, extraterrestrial material and you knew the secret stuff that would, if what you knew as a UFO researcher, it was different once you finally knew the real truth that we were an alien ant farm in this, would you go and tell the world or would you keep the oath? Well, yeah, that, that's the big irony, you know, it's like, what is the big secret? And I mean, I've heard this before where some people have said, you know, if I was really exposed to the big secret, I would, might not release it, but that's that's not what I would do. If I, tomorrow, was given the entire truth of the UFO subject, I wouldn't hesitate to put it all into the public domain. You know, the way I look at it was at the height of the Cold War, you know, we all lived under the threat of nuclear war every day from the Russians, and, you know, in a real nuclear war, no one would win. No, Neither side could win. The planet would be just, you know, civilization would be gone. But we didn't panic. We didn't you know, go to run into mental hospitals. We just got on with our everyday lives and hoped it didn't happen. And so even if they're unsettling things about the UFO phenomenon or some major big secrets, I don't think it could be any worse than total nuclear annihilation. So if I got, if I worked, hypothetically, if I got a job out there, I knew the whole thing and I wanted to blow the whistle. I, I, if I was in Lazar's position, if I was Lazar, I would have, done it because I think I think people should know. I don't think the idea that UFOs exist or aliens exist should be knowledge kept just by a small elite. I think we have a right to know. I think everybody has a right to know if we're not alone, whether they're extraterrestrial or crypto-terrestrial or time travelers or something even weirder. Something's here. Something is amongst us that is not us. And whatever it is, I think everyone should know and i think everyone should know every aspect of the story even if some of it is cool exciting and some of it is downright terrifying we should still be told it all 
I agree, and I would do the same thing because keeping it in such closed hands, you're never going to get truth. Nick, it's been an awesome interview. We have just uh, 10, 20 seconds before the music. I want to give you a chance. If you have one final thought you'd like to give everybody out there listening, what would you say? Um, well, one thing I would say, you know, I always tell people, if you're interested in UFOs, you know, tell people, talk about it. I mean, I, I don't shy away from the fact that this is a fascination for me. I'm not embarrassed by it, and I think... Some people are reticent to talk about it, but, you know, there's, there's nothing wrong. And the more we can just get the word out there, whether, like, with you, with your radio show, books, TV shows, witnesses coming forward, that's the way we're going to get answers. So, you know, stand sort of tall for the UFO subject and get the word out. Well said, everybody. Thanks, Nick Redfern. Join us Thursday. Kathleen Martin live. We'll, we'll be announcing winner number 14. Remember, disclosure is in your hands. This is Dr. J signing out. <laughs>